All right, so I think we can go ahead and get started and we will um, be recording this session. So for those who are popping in a little bit late, you'll be able to review the recording as well. Um, to introduce myself, my name is Brooke Adams. I am one of the admission counselors at Rollins and I'm excited to um, chat with you all tonight about how we have been keeping our uh, Rollins community safe throughout this pandemic. Um, I am joined by Raul, who is a current student, and Connie Briscoe, who is our Director of Wellness at Rollins. So I'm going to let them both introduce themselves. Raul, if you want to go first. Sure. Uh, good evening, everyone. As Brooke said, my name is Raul. I am a current senior here at Rollins, majoring in international relations with like a thousand minors, economics, Middle Eastern North African studies, you name it. Um, and I also work this year as an assistant hall director for two of our first year buildings and then an upperclassman building. So I've been very involved with all the um, COVID guidelines and everything. So it's really interesting. And Connie? Hello, I'm Dr. Connie Briscoe. I am the director of the Wellness Center here at Rollins. I'm also a licensed psychologist and so I'm one of our counseling and psychological services counselors. Uh, and I'm really glad to be here with you all tonight. Awesome. Thank you. So just a couple of housekeeping items for all of you. Um, there is a chat function. So we are going to go through a brief presentation with um, a whole bunch of information. We might cover some of the questions that you have on your minds already. Um, but we do have time at the end that we've reserved to answer any questions that you have that we didn't already cover. Um, so we will take care of those towards the end, but feel free at any point to, to put your questions in the chat box and we will be sure to address them. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Okay. And Raul, does that look all set for you on your end? Okay. Yes, it looks all good. Perfect. So um, we are going to take you through kind of a timeline of what happened ever since we found out about the coronavirus and it became kind of an issue for us here in the US. Um, and so we'll start with March, uh, which is when we really had to um, kind of adapt and change things very quickly. So um, in March, the campus evacuated and we sh swiftly shifted to completely remote learning. Um, faculty and staff worked around the clock over spring break to build the new infrastructure for remote synchronous learning, combining the latest digital technologies with evidence-based teaching methods and practices. The faculty underwent training, which is um, to, to continue to find ways to adapt to virtual learning, which is definitely not the norm at Rollins. One-on-one um, -on -one attention and discussion-based classes um, are at the forefront of a Rollins education. So um, the focus was really to on how can we continue that in, in the virtual world. The faculty have been innovative and have created, uh, have been really creative in the ways that they engage with students virtually. Um, some have been using Google Docs for brainstorming, markup papers and using Apple Pencil, um, utilize virtual breakout rooms for small group discussions, and some STEM professors even mailed lab kits for at-home labs. Um, Raul, I know that you um, took a spring course on the um, virus, so do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. So one of the best things that I believe Rollins did um, at the forefront of the pandemic was that they actually created a little course towards the end of the spring semester that was called Understanding COVID-19. And basically that was a four week course, um, literally at the end of the semester in which um, everyone that enrolled basically just studied COVID-19 in a holistic perspective, meaning that the course gathered professors from the humanities, from English, from biology, biochemistry and chemistry, from business and economics, and also from global health and anthropology. So it was really cool because it was like one week per discipline. So we got to learn um, about past pandemics through English professors. And then we also got to analyze the biology behind COVID-19 and how it affects the body. Then um, the global health perspective with anthropology and medical anthropology professors. And then finally, the economic, political, and um, business perspective on COVID-19. So it was really cool because it demonstrated how Rollins doesn't just want to, you know, obviously face COVID and be able to uh, remain open as a campus during COVID, but also it developed a holistic understanding of the disease at the forefront of it. Like literally the virus came out and uh, just a couple, like 
couple of weeks after Rollins came up with this newly designed course that allowed all the students to get a really deep understanding of how these players work. So it was really, really cool. It was honestly one of my favorite parts of the spring semester. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, so we've wrapped up the spring semester and then um, we over the summer we were we called it reimagining Rollins. And so we were reimagining what Rollins was going to look like for the fall semester. So our leadership, our faculty and staff really worked hard to deliver on its promise of an individualized liberal arts education, which focuses on critical thinking, creativity and mentorship. And so from outdoor classrooms to virtual community engagement, Rollins set out to prove that social distancing doesn't have to mean social isolation. When the fall reopening plan was announced, it gave students and faculty the option to either remain virtual for the fall or to return in person. Approximately 25% of students and 50% of faculty decided to remain virtual. We in the admission office offered and continue to offer guided virtual visits, virtual open houses, one-on-one -on -one counselor chats with us, um, and then one-on-one -on -one video chats with current students. We're also offering small in-person campus tours for students and families right now. Each tour is limited to three families to maximize physical distancing, and we've implemented a number of safety measures to promote the wellness of our visiting families. So skip forward a little bit to fall of 2020, which is Rollins actually reimagined finally. All the planning paid off. Um, Rollins faculty and staff have really laid the foundation for a vibrant, active, and safe campus experience during the COVID-19 pandemic. As our community practices mandatory mask wearing and responsible social distancing, we're also reimagining ways for students to forge and fortify social bonds in an educational environment still very much powered by human relationships. America's most beautiful campus offers an ample space for TARS to gather safely on lawns and plazas for casual chats, as well as classrooms, thanks to the Central Florida climate, which boasts a nearly year round sunshine and annual average temperature of 72 degrees. All classrooms have a minimum of six feet between students and a nine foot separation for the instructor, including the outdoor classrooms. Olin Library is open with socially distanced study spaces and one way traffic flows. Our residence halls are operating at single occupancy rooms and our dining locations have developed safe and flexible plans for occupancy and carry out options. I wanted Raul to talk a little bit about his unique experience as a hall director. Yeah, so definitely being a hall director in the midst of a global pandemic has been a really, really interesting experience that I am really glad I get to put on my resume, first of all. Um, and also, I do have to share that having been, you know, um, someone that had an on-campus experience since two, uh, 2017 as a freshman when COVID wasn't a thing, I really had a commitment to be able to have my residents have an on-campus experience, even though it meant being a little different one, still being able to be on campus. And that is honestly what guides my work as a hall director today, like being able to keep my residents on campus. And I have to say, having been in a pre-COVID and a post-COVID campus, not much has changed, honestly. Like when I think about it, like all the things I used to do as a freshman, a sophomore and a junior, I kind of still do them. I just do them with a mask on and a little social distancing and that's it. But um, I, it's just been really, really good to see the campus still remain a vibrant and active community and being able to be on campus. Again, it's honestly a privilege. and being in the nitty gritty of residential life and being a hall director, I can say that the measures that we are implementing are definitely um, measures that address COVID in a holistic way rather than just like a surface level. So for example, um, our single only occupancy model definitely epidemiologically helps so much um, re to reduce the transmission of the virus. And I personally think it has been one of the top strategies that has allowed Rollins to remain open. And also a um, mandatory mask wearing in all spaces like, like the only place where you cannot, uh, where you can just like not wear your mask is your room. And obviously if you're alone. So um, I don't know, it's super interesting because obviously things are different, but then I look back at how it was when I was a freshman or a sophomore and I'm like, you know what? I'm honestly kind of doing the same thing. So it's really, I'm just really glad to be able to offer all this residents and, and especially incoming students, the opportunity to have an on-campus experience and be present while still um, remaining safe and healthy. So that has definitely been Super, super interesting. And even next semester moving forward, and I hope for hall directors to come, I hope that the, the goal that drives them is definitely keeping their residents on campus, because again, I wouldn't trade an on-campus experience for anything else. 
Thanks, Raul. So let's talk a little bit about um, Rollins Wellness because this was definitely a um, Super, super important moving forward. We wanted to to lay out a, a great foundation for the students and the staff, uh, staff and faculty coming back. So we developed a sophisticated strategy tuned for Rollins, our size, location, and mission, to monitor the presence of COVID on campus throughout the semester. Um, we have rapid tests on site that will allow us to test anyone with symptoms or possible exposure, providing results within 30 minutes. Rollins partnered with BioBot, a biotech firm that tests wastewater effluent from our residence halls on a weekly basis in order to de detect a rise in infection in a residence hall as early as 11 days in advance of symptoms. We also partnered with Rapid Trace, a local firm aiding businesses and institutions like ours with contact tracing services. With Rapid Trace, we can identify and inform people who have been in contact with confirmed cases so they can take the necessary steps to prevent further spread of the disease. And finally, we have developed a daily self-screening app and campus wellness pass. Virtual and in-person counseling and psychological services are still free and available to all students. Connie, is there anything else you would add that I missed? You know, I think the only thing that I would add that's been a huge part of our whole wellness is, is the Taurus Promise, and that is a you know, uh, sort of a code of ethics that all of the students have agreed to abide by. And what we're really seeing is that Rollins students care about their own safety, but even more is the safety of the Rollins campus community. And the um, I think it's it's their actions, the actions of our students, our faculty, our staff um, that has really gone so far to keeping us safe here on campus. So that's the piece I would add. Absolutely, thank you. So on next slide is our campus involvement. So we get a lot of questions about what is campus involvement like? Has it totally gone away? Um, Raul already spoke a little bit to this that it really hasn't gone away. Um, our Center for Inclusion and Campus Involvement created a full menu of both in-person and virtual options that celebrate the college's commitment to unity, diversity, and inclusion. From the Archaeology Club to the Student Government Association to Women in the Sciences, most student organizations were geared up to meet, so students were still able to find the right fit. In accordance with the TARS promise, which Connie just mentioned, in-person meetings of student organizations were at limited capacity and socially distant. Various outdoor campus spots were and are available for meetings, and all open meetings were encouraged to also be virtual for those students who, who did decide to stay virtual for the semester. The creativity and ingenuity of Rollins students continues to be expressed via student media as participation in our newspaper, magazine, and radio station has evolved for social distancing. Rollins Rec Sports organized Saturday paddleboarding on Lake Virginia. Rollins Democracy Project organized as a rally, uh, organized a rally to the polls, pictured here, and debate watch parties. Our Black Student Union and the Pinehurst Organization put together racial social justice workshops. So it's still been a very active student body here on campus. And then um, speaking of staying active, um, it's really easy to stay six feet apart on Rollins' beautiful Lake Virginia, which is the perfect playground for outdoor, socially distanced fun and exercise. You can launch a canoe, a sailboat, a sailboat or paddleboard from the boathouse while abiding by the new rental schedules and guidelines. The fitness center, gym, boathouse, tennis courts, and pool are all still open and available to the Rollins community. Multiple hand sanitizer stations have been installed, and indoor facilities are cleaned regularly throughout each day. A full group fitness schedule of at least 15 socially distanced classes per week um, still are available to our Rollins community. They feature yoga, Zumba, Pilates, and bar. We also offer daily virtual fitness classes. TARS can participate in a variety of intramural sports, including tennis, paddleboarding, frisbee, golf, table tennis, spike ball, and our brand new esports team. And then just in general, student life. Um, it was very important to our student affairs team that we embrace a breadth of creative, low-risk ways to connect with each other on campus. So they've put together things like outdoor movies on the lawn, as well as Saturday night Netflix parties. 
Um, our Center for Leadership and Community Engagement implemented the TARS Together initiative. So that is a weekly schedule of all on-campus and virtual programming that is sent out to the whole Rollins community every Monday. Just recently for the Thanksgiving holiday, Rollins hosted virtual and in-person events all weekend because we knew that a lot of our TARS were gonna be staying on campus for the holiday. So there were things like lawn games, a corn maze, uh, a virtual painting class and crochet class, and our dining services staff, of course, made sure that every community member who stayed on campus had a wonderful Thanksgiving meal that we all shared together in the campus center. I don't know if anyone else has anything to add about student life or what the community life has been like still at Rollins. Okay. So um, that is our brief presentation. Like I said, I wanted to make sure we left a lot of room um, for your questions and things that you guys are curious about. So um, I am going to stop sharing my screen so that I can see all of your questions. All right. So um, what is campus going to be? What is campus life going to be like next year? <laughs> Will it be a combo of virtual and in-person learning? Courtney, I think you asked the question that we all have on our minds. Um, we are very, very hopeful that by the time the next class enrolls and is here in August, that things will be back to somewhat normalcy. Um, but of course, we don't really know yet. Um, we don't know what that's going to look like. All we know is that we have some really great plans in place. Um, and we've obviously done a pretty good job this semester so that if we had to continue things in the way that we're continuing, we have a pretty solid foundation that we've built. All right. So Raul, maybe you wanna take Lori's question. She asks, um, are you saying that all students have a single room? Yeah, so basically, um, at least now in fall 2020, and it has actually been um, also, uh, you know, like kind of set for spring 2021, all students on campus do have a single room, but I do have to say that we count on campus with two apartment style residential projects, the Lakeside Neighborhood and Southern Apartments Complex. And in the, in the case of this apartment, they have single rooms themselves and students have their own private bathroom. So they only share like the living area and the kitchen area. So in that case, you do have two or four people per apartment, depending on how many single rooms per apartment. Um, but in terms of sharing like a bedroom itself, no one is sharing bedrooms this year. Everyone has a, a single room. In the in the traditional buildings, you know, your typical dorm where you have doubles and triples, all of those rooms are actually converted to singles, at least for the remainder of fall 2020 and also um, all of spring 2021. Awesome, thanks. So, um, so, Let's see, there was a question then, how is on-campus housing going to be? Are we going to have roommates? Again, we hope so. Um, we'll kind of have to see where we're at in August, um, but if all is well and we feel comfortable and confident with that, we would like to, to return to kind of the roommate setup um, for the incoming class. Connie, Isabella asks, how many known COVID cases were there on campus so far this school year? That's a um, great question. And I don't have it, the answer off the top of my head. Um, what I can tell you is that um, if you go to our COVID dashboard, you can kind of get an idea of, about what we have per week. We've been averaging probably about uh, four to five cases per week. So our numbers are low, significantly lower than um, than Orange County, certainly than Florida. We've really been able to um, kind of get a good handle on it and keep the numbers really relatively low. We've been very pleased with that. Yeah. Um, Karen asks, what are the COVID-19 guidelines for the music department? What performance opportunities do students have during the pandemic? So the music department had to get particularly creative um, because they obviously, when they sing their, um, and when they play their instruments, it, it's, it becomes a little bit more complicated. So they got really creative and um, they did have to make their ensemble sizes a little bit smaller, but ensembles are still able to rehearse. They rehearse in our auditorium. So they stand far enough apart, even more than six feet apart, so that when they sing, they sing with their masks on, but when they sing, they can still um, be safely distant from each other. 
So they've gotten creative. The instrumentalist, um, if they're like a woodwind player where you have where you're having to blow air into an instrument, um, they've been putting up plexiglass barriers. Um, they've been doing some um, virtual instruction, but a lot in person. Um, and then for performances, um, they've been able to perform. Again, luckily we have a lot of outdoor space to be able to hold host concerts. Um, they have their, their Christmas Vespers concert coming up. They're actually doing that in the large central park right here that we have in Winter Park. Um, that's coming up, I believe next week. That's gonna be outdoor and free for Winter Park residents. Um, they also did just this past weekend, um, a huge concert. Uh, it's called Songs of the Season. They do it every year. So it's a big Christmas concert that they do out on the Dr. Phillips Performing Arts Center lawn. Um, if you're not from Orlando, Dr. Phillips is a beautiful performing arts center, professional performing arts center. So it's really cool for our students to get that opportunity. Let's see. Um, will we be able to leave campus during breaks? So, um, Connie, maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, but we've we, what we did this semester in the fall was we, we shifted our um, semester back by a couple of weeks. So instead of starting in August, we started September 14th. And because of that, we, got, we did away with fall break. And so the only break that the students really had was the Thanksgiving holiday. We didn't um, forbid students from you know, seeing family or traveling for Thanksgiving, but we did encourage those students that left or did travel for Thanksgiving to then stay virtual for the remainder of this semester. Um, many students decided just to stay on campus for Thanksgiving. Um, so again, nobody's going to forbid anyone from doing anything, but again, just kind of that TARS promise idea of just being um, as responsible as you can. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think, you know, our idea around safety is that we want students, if they do leave campus, whether it's for a break or maybe a birthday party just in the semester to go home for a weekend or whatever, is to abide by those safety guidelines to make sure that they're wearing their mask at all time to make sure that they're not engaging in any large parties or large gatherings, et cetera. Um, anytime students are curious about whether or not they can go away safely and come back, we just encourage them to call the Wellness Center and we will work with each and every student individually to come up with a good solid plan on how they can safely leave campus if they need to do so and what we would recommend when they come back on campus in order to keep them and our campus community safe. All right, Raul, maybe you wanna take this question from Emmett. Um, have you heard anything from the freshman class about challenges connecting with other classmates? Okay, perfect. So, um, actually, before getting to that, I just wanted to add real quick to the traveling during breaks and stuff like that, that um, a big, big, big part um, this semester and obviously for next semester too, and as long as we need to, is um, holding yourself accountable, I would say, um, in the end, because it, it is about the community and not about ourselves only. So for example, I personally had to fly back home to the Dominican Republic in the, in, in the middle of the semester because I needed to renew my passport. But what I did was I tested myself before leaving so that I wasn't, you know, like jeopardizing anyone going there. And then when I came back, I actually did a self mandated quarantine in my room and then got tested after quarantine. Um, and only then I was like, I left my room because in the end, if you do things safely, then, um, yeah, of course, like reduce the risk as much as possible and then just hold yourself accountable and hold yourself to high standards when it comes to protecting the community. And that's how we have been able to remain open. So, yeah. And then um, can you repeat the question about the freshmen? I'm sorry. I just had to say that real quick. Yep. Just um, have you heard anything from the freshman class in particular about challenges being able to connect with other classmates? Okay. So, um, obviously, not going to lie. Definitely. Like, um, you know, there's no roommates and some classes are completely virtual. So there are some challenges in place and those are things that we can't just ignore, like we, we acknowledge them. But acknowledging that these um, challenges are in place, that's why we, as, especially as residential life staff, we have amped up the efforts to provide opportunities for students to interact safely, especially among the halls themselves. So for example, um, all the freshman hall directors, we decided to put together a humongous hall council with representatives from all the hall councils so that they can get together and um, plan events for all the halls. Um, and also we have amped up our programs involving both in-person and virtual um, components to our programs in the hall so that people can get to interact more with the other residents. So recognizing that there are less opportunities for 
these natural interactions to happen, especially between people that haven't known each other. Um, we have been providing all these spaces for people to be able to meet each other. Great, thank you. Um, so there's two questions here that maybe Connie, you'd be able to address. Um, one was, um, how do you handle it if a student needs to quarantine? Can they easily switch to taking their classes online? And then the next one was, if a student tests positive on campus, what measures are taken to prevent the spread of COVID and how is the infected person cared for while isolating? Okay, yeah. So those are um, two great questions and they kind of are connected very similarly. So if a student were to test positive, um, either here at the wellness center or off campus and um, and then they tell us that they tested positive. We're going to work with that student to get them um, into isolation, which that which basically um, often means is that we put them in a really nice, comfortable space in our newest residential hall, probably one of the most coveted areas, I would say, our isolation spaces. Um, and as Raul was saying, each of those rooms are there's there are set four different rooms in an apartment style living. So even though they're isolated in their room, they're not completely isolated, right? They're isolated with other individuals. Typically, if we have more than one student who's in isolation, we um, we work very closely with residential life to help the student get moved over to get in the room. They receive a care package. They receive um, phone calls text messages every day from people at the wellness center, from student and family care, uh, their RAs check in on them, Stu fellow students send them care packages and well wishes. So um, lots and lots of connection. We work with them to make sure that they're getting meals delivered to their room, anything that they might need, medication delivered, anything of that nature. Um, as a result of contact tracing, once we find out that somebody tested positive, then what we're gonna do is, um, get in touch with, uh, well, the agency that we contract with, Rapid, Rapid Trace, gets in touch with any of their close contacts, does an interview, and then makes recommendations based on quarantining. Um, so if a student needs to quarantine, depending on where they live, but typically the student can stay in their room. We just ask them to stay in their room, um, and they're given lots of guidelines, and the same care that our students in isolation. They get a care package, they get their meals delivered, they get phone calls, we have a support, a virtual support group for students who are in quarantine and isolation where the, every day they can drop in and connect with each other. Um, so our students are really, really well cared for. Um, the idea is just to remove them from going to classes. We help them um, immediately. They don't have to do any work on their own. We just help contact their faculty. The faculty know only that they won't be attending classes in person, that it'll be virtual. Um, and and it's it's really pretty easy. Yeah, and a follow up question to that was: Is the quarantine in the quarantine residence building? Are there students in the same building that are not sick, or is the building only for sick students? So the the quarantine students um, are definite or are in that they can stay in their own residence. We just ask them to stay in their rooms to to re really reduce the amount of time they come out. So. Um, Students in quarantine, we encourage them to go outside briefly by themselves, get some fresh air, uh, et cetera. Students, the only students we remove from their rooms are those who have actually tested positive for COVID-19, and that depends on where they're actually living. If they have a single room with a single bathroom, a lot of times they can actually stay in their in their current residence room. Cool. Raul, you have something to add? Yeah, I just wanted to add that um, even though people that do ha that have to quarantine, depending on their living situation, they can remain in the residence hall. Obviously, um, all the residential staff in the building is um, alerted about this. So what that means is that we really ensure that that person is, you know, obviously in the room and, and they only like leave outside for a limited amount of time. And again, as Connie mentioned, it's always good to know that those people that get to remain in the hall, they are not confirmed positive cases. Like as soon as someone is a confirmed positive case, then they get taken to the isolated spaces that are actually like in a separate wing of the residential hall where only those people are located. Yep, so Emily, just to clarify, um, you asked are all dorm single rooms? Typically no, but this year, yes. Um, so we've made sure that all students have their own dorm room this year. Um, and there was a question earlier, are you able to accommodate all the students because less students are on campus? 
Yes, we didn't have a problem. So everybody who did want to return to campus and live on campus, we were able to find a single occupancy dorm room for. Um, we had enough students who decided to remain virtual or um, had a space off campus that they were living in. Um, that we were able to accommodate every student that wanted to return and live on campus. All right, so Courtney asks, I applied for elementary education. I was wondering what the classroom experiences looked like now. Um, I know you guys offer hands on learning. So, yeah, I think for the education students, it's probably been a, a little bit of a challenge, just like it has been for the music students. Um, but I do think that probably we are having our um, education students still um, do their shadowing, whether that's virtual or in person. It probably depends on how that particular school that they were paired with is operating. Um, so if they're in person, they might be going and doing their hours, um, you know, with a mask or whatever the rules or mandates are at that school. But I'm sure that that's all still up and running um, just as it is. Yeah, Raul, go ahead. Yeah, I have a lot of friends actually that are like uh, elementary education majors. And something that I can say what from what they have told me is that they are actually low key thankful for everything that has been happening in the regards that they get to learn so many alternative options of educating kids and everything that they hadn't known before. So they really feel like this circumstances that obviously were put again, like honest against their will are actually preparing them for a future education um, and like the future education system. So in a way, um, you know, at the, especially at the last year of the education program, you're actually teaching like that's the main part of it and i have all my friends actually teaching whether it's virtually or um as brooke said depending on what school they're affiliated with but if there's something that i have been able to hear is that they still get kind of the same experience like that in-person um shadowing and mentorship and everything and actually even get prepared for um what might actually be the future of education in general awesome uh okay let's see there is a question about Raul, maybe you could take this one in the quarantine resident. Um, let's see. Oh, what's in the care package and how does the communal bathroom situation work? How do how do students safely take showers and brush their teeth and all that? OK, so uh, in regards of the care package, I actually don't know. So Connie might have the answer to that. But in regards of the community bathrooms, so um, Unless you're like, let's say, obviously brushing your teeth or showering, um, people do wear their masks in the community bathrooms. And I do have to say that the sanitizing and cleanliness procedures for community bathrooms has been like extremely amped up to the level of like now they clean the bathrooms like every 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 single day, sometimes multiple times a day. So the only times in which people don't have masks on in the bathrooms is like when it's basically absolutely necessary. And something that I have always said, honestly. Um, whenever I'm giving campus tours, even in pre-COVID times, is that, you know, people often have ideas of community bathrooms as this, like, super packed spaces and, like, there's nothing available because everyone's using everything. It will be really hard for you to, like, find yourself in a packed community bathroom, I'm not going to lie. I, I, I used community bathrooms for three years of my uh, college experience, and I was never, even in pre-COVID times, in, like, any packed community bathroom. So, I would say that honestly, um, they're still really, really safe. And again, people do wear masks at all times in the bathrooms unless they absolutely need to take them off to like brush their teeth or shower. But yeah, it's overall a very safe experience too. Connie, do you know what goes into the care packages? Um, I believe we have a combination of things. There's um, information around, you know, how to make, you know, what to look for, who to contact if you're not feeling well, that kind of information. Um, prior to the semester starting, we had a group of students who got together and put together um, like cards and and just positive and uplifting messages and that, that kind of stuff is in the care packages. Also just things that people can do um, to, to pass the time, that's a good solitary act activity. So puzzles and and things of that nature and in the care packages. So it's a variety of things. And my guess is it's probably changed somewhat across the semester because one of the things we're also doing is constantly asking our students when they get out of quarantine or isolation, you know, like what worked, what didn't work, what would be helpful for you. And we continue to adjust what's in, in the care packages and how we're meeting those needs. Awesome. I don't know if either of you know the answer. I don't know the answer to um, Isabella's question. Does Rollins have any special filters in the dorm buildings or the academic buildings? 
I don't believe we are using any special filters. Now that's not one of the things that was recommended from um, COVID-19 or the various um, health professionals that we've been able to um, to work with. So I, I, it's mostly making sure things are cleaned and um, sanitized very closely, um, not necessarily filters. I, I will add real quick that even though um, there weren't any like, you know, special filters installed, what Rollins did do, at least from the residential life side, is that as soon as um, the CDC guidelines were posted on what, you know, probably more effective filters would be, the college did check um, if the filters currently in place match those requirements and they actually exceed. That's why there was no replacement necessary in that case. Gotcha. Um, okay, so there's a question about what kind of COVID testing is required on campus, and I don't believe we ever had a, a requirement, um, but maybe, Connie, do you want to talk about all the opportunities for testing and, and suggestions for testing? Yeah, so we, we definitely have lots of different opportunities for testing. Anyone um, symptomatic or non-symptomatic who wants to be tested um, can do so. What we have is if a student um, isn't feeling well, if they have any of the symptoms for COVID or faculty or staff member um, with that Campus Clear app that we created, that app would tell that person to contact the Wellness Center. When they would contact us, anyone who contacts us with any symptoms for COVID-19, we encourage them to come on into the Wellness Center where we can both do a test to see whether or not it's COVID-19 and to actually just kind of see what's going on and provide medical care for anyone who's not feeling well. Um, and so most of our testing is done in that um, framework. We also have testing. We have a lot of students and individuals who um, maybe had a close exposure to someone and they're just worried about whether or not they ha might have gotten COVID-19. And so even though they're not feeling bad, they have no symptoms, they will come in and get testing um, just for peace of mind. Uh, the other way that students um, and faculty and staff might get tested is through contact tracing. Um, and so if we know that someone has had a close contact and again, um, they're they're worried about it, they're going to come in and, and get tested. The, the only, I guess, when I say required testing, it's really not totally required. We do have, um, if what we're doing is we're trying to make sure we're doing um, what we're calling surveillance testing. It's not really surveillance, but basically it's educated guesses as to where incidences of COVID might be. So let's say we do have a student who tests positive, who lives in a communal, lives on a floor where there's a communal bathroom. We're gonna contact everyone on that floor and say, we would like you to get tested. What happens then is that student has two choices. They can come in and get tested or they can go into quarantine. Um, so, in a sense, there's an option to not test by just self quarantining uh, when we've not required testing. Now, that is going to be different in the spring in that um, all of our residential students are going to be required to be tested between five and seven days after they return after the winter break. So, that'll be our first um, time of actual required tests. And all of our non residential students can opt in to get tested when they come back. We also have done things like prior to Thanksgiving, we've encouraged people who were going home if they want to, they can come and get tested prior to leaving. Um, students who are going home for winter break, if they would like to come and get tested prior to leaving, they can come on over and get tested. So lots and lots of optional tests um, and very little actual required test. Yeah, go ahead, Raul. Yeah, I just wanted to give a quick shout out to um, my favorite testing plan on campus, which was the Protein Biodiagnostics um, testing program. Basically, Rollins started out with this biotechnology company called Protein Biodiagnostics, and they have basically these trials in which um, you did some self-administered tests. Like you will go to a, a location on campus where they had some um, uh, registered nurses, like obviously ready to help you if you needed any help. But it was basically a self-administered like. Um, basically surface um, nasal swab and also like a spit collection. And basically th they did two tests. They did a PCR test that they would like email you the results um, in probably four to five days. And then they actually got a second sample to develop an even more accurate um, COVID test. So obviously it was, it was a clinical trial. Um, you had the right to like participate or not. It, it was like optional, but I found it super awesome because it was an asymptomatic um, 
testing facility. So basically, if you didn't have any symptoms, uh, Rollins did this partnership so they could keep track of basically um, how many asymptomatic, uh, asymptomatic cases we had on campus. And thanks to that, I got five PCR tests for free, which um, each one of them is close to $200. So, you know, that's kind of a really good deal. And basically, I personally found that really cool because that means that I got a regular testing regime for more than two months. So I knew during that time that I was COVID free, which is really good to know, honestly. So yeah, that was one of my favorite things. Okay, there was a question about athletics. Um, do we think that, you know, we'll be able to play sports next year? Um, again, we, we hope so. Um, I wish I could give more concrete answers to these questions, but, you know, we, we really do hope so. Um, it'll be a conference wide decision. So um, our conference makes that decision, makes that call each semester. Um, so we'll see. But as you saw in the presentation, you know, even without varsity level sports, we still have found a lot of ways to remain active and provide fitness class opportunities for our students. Um, you can always check out sailboats and canoes and paddle boards and take them out of the lake and um, all of pretty much anywhere on campus, the gym, the um, tennis courts, all of that is still open and available for our students to stay active. Um, so hopefully we'll be playing sports in the fall, um, but we'll have to just kind of wait and see. There are also a couple of questions about admission. So I want to address those. Um, one was, are the SATs required for admission? The answer to that is no. Um, Rollins has been a test optional school for over 10 years. So you don't have to submit a test score to be considered for admission. Um, we know that that's been a, a challenge this year being able to sit for an exam um, to even be able to present a score. So, so you do not have to submit test scores. And if you don't submit test scores, you will still be considered for the full range of scholarships. All of the opportunities for you will be the same as it would be if you were to submit a test score. Um, and then one other one was something about um, is, is there still going to be rooms available? Yes, we haven't started any. Um, any of the housing process yet for the for the new incoming class for August. So there's still plenty of that available. Okay. Is COVID testing free for students? Yes, it's free for the Rollins community. That's been a real um, big plus and for our students and for our staff and faculty. Okay, and then we so there was a question that came through about with the thought that there might be a vaccine available is there any plan to require a vaccination maybe for the fall of 2021 um we are talking about that um we're we're in discussion but um, we're not we haven't made a decision yet if we're going to require a vaccination we're kind of waiting for guidance from um you know, some doctors and our legal teams and all of that fun stuff. So we will um, definitely make an announcement and let everyone know what the procedures are, um, but that's being discussed. Okay, a couple more questions about admissions. I know some of you are seniors and you have applied. Some of you may have already heard back from us. So congratulations if you're on this call and you've already been admitted. Um, for those of you who have applied and are waiting, we are working around the clock to get decisions out as quickly as we can. Um, so if you haven't heard back from us yet, hopefully you will soon. Um, we, we have released some decisions already and we continue to do so on a weekly basis. Um, so it's likely that you'll hear back from us soon. We don't guarantee decisions until April 1st. So to even be hearing from us in December is pretty exciting to begin with. Um, so if you haven't heard from us yet, uh, just keep your keep your eyes out on your emails. Um, and we also send the hard copies in the letter, uh, the letters in the mail too. All right. Yes, Raul, go ahead. Yeah, I just have one quick question on like the actual Q&A section, not the chat from Kelsey. And it says I'm interested in freshman field study, the Costa Rica one. Does it look possible for next fall? So obviously we can't really predict what will happen, but um, I work really closely with international programs. So I know a lot about their policies, everything beyond the spring. So summer field, summer study abroad programs, and then like those um, field studies that happen like early fall or late summer, stuff like that are still in course um we cannot guarantee that, that that'll be the case like if that they will you know actually happen but they are in in course like they 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 still are supposed to happen basically 
All right, are you guys seeing any questions come through that we haven't addressed? There was, there was a question about SATs being required for admission and whether or not they're required. So, so. Yeah, so those are not, yep. Just talked about that a little bit. There was a question about Thanksgiving and maybe they, maybe um, whoever asked that question tuned in a little bit late because we did talk a little bit about that. Um, the campus made sure to um, offer tons of different events all throughout that whole weekend. We knew that a lot of people would be staying on campus and we even wanted to provide virtual opportunities for students maybe staying on campus that didn't want to attend any in-person events or um, for students who maybe are virtual, but wanted to still tune into what Rollins was doing. So um, there were things like painting and crochet classes. There was a huge corn maze on campus that looked really fun. Um, there was like a movie night, I think, on the lawn. Um, and then of course our fabulous Rollins dining team made sure that um, all of the Rollins community that was on campus had a wonderful Thanksgiving dinner. Okay. If you guys have any other questions, please feel free to type them in um, and we'll hang out for a couple more minutes and just see if anything else comes through. Um, there's another admission question. If we didn't apply early decision, will scholarships still be available? Yes, of course, we still consider all students who apply for all of our scholarships. All right, everyone. Well, thank you so much for attending tonight. Um, we, we, we will stick around for just another two or three minutes to see if any last minute questions come through. Um, but again, thanks for taking the time out of your evening to tune in with us. Um, we were so happy to share this information with you. Um, feel free to log off. Um, this is kind of the end of our presentation, but Raul, Connie, and I will stick around for just maybe two or three more minutes to see if you guys had any additional questions. Thanks so much. So a question just came through about the activities. Um, have we had fun activities to do despite COVID? And the answer is yes. We've had a lot of really fun activities um, for students to participate in despite COVID. It's been a learning process for us. It's been a learning process for our students, trying to figure out what students feel comfortable doing, how they would like to engage. We've had a number of both virtual and face-to-face -face activities. We just make sure we follow all of our safety protocols. Probably some of the most attended ones more recently was um, just uh, last week we had an axe throwing um, event where we had a large number of students who attended that um, and that was a lot of fun. Tomorrow we're hosting a relaxation station on campus where our students will be able to come and do cuddle with kittens or do arts and crafts or make mindfulness jars um, and lots of fun things around there. Yoga uh, is a popular activity that we've had on campus. So lots and lots of fun things. And I know Raul, you might want to add, but I know within the residential halls, um, our RAs and residential team have been working to have lots of fun activities for students also. Yeah, so honestly, I'm still shocked at the ideas that my RAs and all the RAs come up with in terms of programming. It's actually kind of crazy how creative they are. For example, I'm um, usually one like a very common RA event is, you know, hosting movie nights, but obviously that's not something that we can really do now, like having people all together in a room. So, for example, one of my RAs, what they did was host a virtual um, movie night, but they were in the common room with popcorn and like snacks and stuff like that. And people could come in like shift to pick up their prepackaged snacks and take them back to the room to attend the virtual movie night. And Overall, just like so, so many things. And again, uh, the fact that COVID is um, still here doesn't mean that we don't have in-person programs. It's just that we make sure that they abide by the COVID-19 guidelines. Like for, for example, um, we set up our common rooms in the halls to respect social distancing at all times. And for example, a really, really amazing event that we had once was a Mario Kart night that turned into like probably the most competitive event I've ever seen on campus. And what we did was um, separate people in shifts so they could come and um, basically still have a room of social distance people and we sanitize the remotes after each person played. So, you know, like we still do have all these really interactive and fun programs. It's just that they look a little bit different. So they adapt to the recent guidelines. Sky, I see your question about why we haven't required testing. 
COVID testing until the spring. Um, you know, a part of this is our knowledge and uh, of COVID continues to shift and our, our, our uh, knowledge of um, effective practices continues to shift. Uh, back when we opened, the CDC was recommending that we do not do mass testing of individuals. There are a lot of different reasons for that recommendation. And so we really decided to take a strategic approach. Rather than requiring mass testing, we um, decided to use our affluent testing, uh, contact tracing, and where we know that symptomatic looking for trends, um, et cetera, to help us to do more of a systematic targeted approach to testing. Since that time, as we've continued to see what's working and what's not working, we have made the decision to do testing as we return in the spring in terms of one mass testing, um, just for sort of a baseline, peace of mind, et cetera. Also in the fall, we did something similar and Raul talked about that. We had that partnership with Protean, that was, but that was much more of a, um, you can come or not. And the reason that was not required was because that was a research study and you can't require people to participate in a research study versus what we're doing in the spring. We will do that. We will require everyone to get tested just so that we know where we're standing. If anyone happens to be positive, we're not expecting many people to be positive. We're guessing out of everyone who comes back, maybe one or two probably will test positive and we can move them into an isolation space and just to keep it from spreading. But we really follow the science and we, we follow our guidelines that come to us from our state, state um, connected epidemiologist um, in making all of these decisions. All right, and there was a question about um, facilities being open. So our library, yes, has been open the entire time, they, but um, you know, separate spaces. There, there's common spaces that are socially distant. There's single um, study spaces, and then there's um, kind of a floor plan for you to follow so that there's just one way patterns, walk patterns through the library. Um, I think we've covered all of the questions, unless you guys see any that we haven't. Oh, in case of severe COVID symptoms, does the college have ventilators? So. No, the college does not, but we have um, a hospital very close to us. We can get students there very quickly. Um, and so in, in that case, the person would really need that round the clock medical care. Um, we do monitor ventilators um, in terms of are our hospitals having enough ventilators um, available so that if we ever need to get someone, is that a, you know, that's going to be a safety risk that allows us to determine, do we stay open or do we switch to virtual? Um, but so far we're fine. All the hospitals have enough occupancy. They have enough ventilators, et cetera, but that's not that level of care is not something we could do on campus. Well, thank you all so much for sticking around this evening. Um, we're so happy to share all this information with you. Hope everyone has a wonderful, warm, um, happy holiday season. Thank you guys so much. Have a great evening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.